Good morning and welcome to Shalom Mennonite Church. Those of you who are in the sanctuary as well as those who are online, wherever and whenever you may be. Today is the second Sunday in Lent and Pastor Jarrell will be preaching today from Mark 8, 31 to 38 and the cost of following Jesus. The Lenten season has a particular meaning for my family. Eight years ago today, February 25, was the work workplace shooting at the Excel plant in Heston, uh, now owned by Stanley Black and Decker. My son Adam was among the shooting victims. He amazingly, uh, perhaps miraculously, survived and wept for the man who attempted to kill him. Yet four people died that day, and 13 others were injured, injuries that have had uh, a long-standing physical and psychological entailments. Part of our reflection during Lent is that God is with us, and yet we continue to live in a world of pain and tragedy. As I light the peace lamp today, we think of the conflict in the Ukraine, the conflict in Gaza, and also we will remember the workplace violence in Heston eight years ago. Let us bow for prayer. Lord Jesus, you call your disciples to take up their crosses and to follow you. We admit we are afraid of pain and death. Search within us today for those things that cause death in ourselves and risk harm to others. Fill us with compassion for those who, like us, are fearful and dangerous. As we focus on you, we gain hope that we can pass through death to a greater life beyond. By the power of your spirit and in your name, amen.
For the call to worship, I direct your attention to the screen. Please participate as indicated there. Come, you who seek God, proclaim God's glory. Come. 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 Come you who seek God, proclaim God's glory, and walk in faith. I invite you to stand and sing. Um, we'll start with 540, Will You Come and Follow Me? Remain standing and turn to 444, I sing with exaltation.
I invite the children to come forward. It's great to see you today. This morning I'm going to be reading a book, and maybe you've seen it or heard it before, but it's a good one to hear and see again. It's called God's Dream, and it was written by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Douglas Carlton Abrams, and the illustrator was Leeuwen Pham. I'm not sure if I said that name right, but close enough, I hope. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do whatever your heart desires? or about being treated like a full person, no matter how young you might be. Do you know what God dreams about? I don't, but this is what they think. If you close your eyes and look with your heart, I'm sure, dear child, that you will find out. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. God dreams that we reach out and hold one another's hand and play one another's games, and laugh with one another's hearts. But God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that we get angry and hurt one another. Soon we start to feel sad and so very alone. Sometimes we cry, and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and God's tears, too. Each of us carries a piece of God's God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters. Yes, even you and me, even if we have different mommies and daddies or live in different faraway lands. Even, let's not touch it. Even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God, even if we have different eyes or different skin, Even if you are taller than I am, even if your nose is little and mine is large, dear God, dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? No, no, don't do that. It's quite easy. As easy as sharing, loving, caring, as easy as holding, playing, laughing, as easy as knowing we are family because... We are children of God. Will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. God smile smiles like a rainbow when you do. So let's pray. God Help us to be kind and loving and sharing. Amen.
We come to a time now of gathering gifts. If you contribute online, there should be a a green card near you in the benches there. Uh, You may place in the baskets as they come by if you wish. And this is an opportunity also to pass the black pads down the row and uh, add your name and then uh, notice who is sitting next to you. Let's pause for prayer. Generous God, as we recognize all your gifts to us, infuse in us your generosity toward others. Amen. We come now to a time of confession. Should be on the screen soon there. Follow along with the uh, part marked people. Trustworthy God, we want to live with faith, yet we worry there will not be enough. We want to live in your promises, yet we lose hope. We want to follow you, but sometimes the road is too hard. Shape us into a people who will live in faith. Strengthen us so that we can deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow you.
El Evangelio de Marcos 8, versículos 31 a 38. Jesús comenzó a enseñarles que el Hijo del Hombre tendría que pasar por muchos sufrimientos y ser rechazado por los ancianos líderes, los jefes de los sacerdotes y los maestros de la ley. Tendría que morir, pero a los tres días resucitaría. Les dijo todo lo que tenía que pasar. No les ocultó nada. Pero Pedro habló a solas con Jesús y comenzó a reprenderlo. Entonces Jesús se dio vuelta, miró a los seguidores y regañó a Pedro diciendo, Largo de aquí, Satanás. A ti no te preocupan las cosas de Dios, sino las de la gente. Luego Jesús llamó a la gente y a sus seguidores y les dijo, Si alguien quiere ser mi seguidor, tiene que renunciar a sí mismo, aceptar la cruz que se le da y seguirme. Pues el que quiera salvar su vida, la perderá. Pero el que la pierda por mi causa y por mi mensaje, la salvará. De nada vale tener todo el mundo y perder la vida. Nadie podrá pagar lo suficiente para recuperar su vida. La gente de hoy en día es infiel y pecadora. Si alguien se avergüenza de mí y de mi enseñanza ante de esta gente, entonces yo también me avergonzaré de él cuando venga en la gloria de mi Padre con los santos ángeles. Mark 8, 31-38 Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Can y'all hear me? There we go. Hey. 
I could play the voice of the Lord if we ever do a reenactment. Good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you all today. Um, I hope that you all have had a good week. Um, this week marks the second um, Sunday of our Lenten theme, Christ Among Us. Last week, we kicked off the series by looking at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and how he was a disruption to the world. This morning, we are back in Mark's gospel, and we are dealing with an interesting argument between Jesus and Peter. We will see how Jesus calls for his followers to walk the same path that he himself takes. Please join me in prayer. Lord our God, we thank you for this day. Um, we thank you for everyone that's gathered here this morning. We thank you for everyone um, watching online. And God, uh, we pray that your presence would be with us this morning. Help us to hear and receive your word today. Speak to us and help us to listen. God, help us to um, strip away and put down any burdens that we walk into this place with. Carry those for us in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I would like to begin my sermon um, with a story from 1963. Since um, it is the last Sunday of Black History Month, I feel that it is appropriate to share with you all a powerful story about commitment and risk. How many of y'all, show of hands, how many of y'all have heard of the Children's March in 1963? Okay, we have a couple of folks. Also called the Children's Crusade. Um, there's also a Children's Crusade in Europe, but that's different than the one I'm referring to. Towards the end of April in 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. and other activists faced a huge problem. They had been trying to end segregation in Alabama, but due to several failed attempts in other parts of the South, the movement had lost a lot of steam. In fact, when Dr. King bonded out of jail in Birmingham, he was under a lot of pressure to re-energize the movement. He argued that the only way for them to break Birmingham would be to feel the jail. Feel, F-E-E-L, feel the jail. Meaning that the only way to get justice done would be by protesting so relentlessly that they would inevitably be placed in jail. Now, this idea did not sit well with many people. Birmingham had been known as one of the most violent and racist cities towards black people. It was even nicknamed Bombingham for the amount of unsolved bombings that happened in black neighborhoods and black communities. So Dr. King and others tried to recruit adults to participate in sit-ins and marches with them, but few adults were willing to participate. Many argued that they could not risk going to jail and potentially losing their jobs because many of them worked for white businesses. They were not willing to face the beatings and water hoses, and rightfully so, I may add. With the activists getting worried about losing all of the momentum, James Bevel, a member of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, came up with an idea. Bevel proposed that since adults could not commit to the movement, then let's get children involved in the march. So he teamed up with a local DJ in Birmingham and they began to train and teach the kids about freedom and nonviolent resistance. Now this was a huge decision. Up to this point, Dr. King and other activists had been opposed to getting children involved in the movement because of the risk of facing violence. When Dr. King was released from jail, he went and spoke at a local church and begged, begged for volunteers to come forward to join the movement. 
but no one stood up in the church except for the children. King eventually said no, they would not go forward with the children. He wasn't going to allow for the children to risk their lives. But the children, along with some leadership from a few adults, decided to plan a march anyway. They used the radio to um, give code words to let them know when the meeting would be, when uh, the march would happen. And on May 2nd, 1963, thousands of black students skipped school in order to participate in the protests that would later be named the Children's Crusade. Youth ranging from 7 to 18 were marching, carrying picket signs, singing freedom songs. They marched daily for a week. The, the police responded to the peaceful marching by arresting many of them. They were sprayed with water hoses, hoses attacked by police dogs. They sat in jail for days at a time. And once they were released, they went back to marching. Records report that there were 2,000 students arrested during the days of protest. And many historians argue that this moment, that this moment in history served as a catalyst for change to end segregation in Birmingham. It re-energized the movement when people saw that children were being attacked. They wanted to act. In this story, we have a group of people who were not willing to give up their jobs in order to protest for a better future. In the same story, we have a group of children who are committed to peace, justice, and equality. They showed this commitment by protesting and marching against racism. And I think about this moment in history when I read our scripture passage for this morning. In our passage for today, we have Jesus getting into an argument with Peter. Our passage begins with Jesus teaching the disciples as he was known to do. The text tells us that Jesus told them that he must endure great suffering and he would eventually be rejected and killed but that he would be resurrected in three days. And here is Jesus letting the disciples know what is going to happen to him if they continue down this path. Peter does not, I mean, Peter does what I imagine any friend would do when hearing someone say this. The text says that Peter rebuked Jesus and told him to not speak of such things. Now, Peter, I want to be clear about this, Peter is not wrong for what he does here. Peter has seen the strength of the Roman Empire. He knows that any opposition to the empire would be met with the sword. Also, Jesus is supposed to be their Messiah. He is supposed to be the one that leads them into a new world. How can Jesus do this if he is killed? How can he do that if the people reject him? Jesus responds to Peter's rebuke with these powerful words, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus is letting Peter know that he is focused on the wrong thing. Jesus then calls the crowd forward and says, If you want to be my followers, let them, let any who want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain? the whole world, and forfeit their life. Here Jesus is letting the people know that following Christ can cost you something. 
This is the same message for us today. Friends, following the ethics of Jesus can cost us something. Jesus here is saying that this road that we are traveling inevitably leads to a conflict with the empire. That commitment to God is more than simple prayer or baptism or church attendance. Jesus is saying to the crowd that this, to the crowd and his disciples, that if you are going to follow me, there may be trouble. And if you are not deeply committed to this cause, then maybe you should not be here. This, I believe, is Jesus' warning for everyone. Here Jesus challenges people to commit to a committed faith that matches the commitment that God has made to creation. Jesus does not have to go against the forces of evil in the world. Jesus does not have to advocate for the oppressed. Jesus does not have to heal the wounded, but Jesus does these things anyway. He does these things because of his deep love and commitment to people. The gospel narrative shows a picture, a picture of Jesus who risks his life for others. And friends, this is the hard part of the gospel. The gospel calls us to take, to, calls us to take risks, not only for ourselves and for our own families, but for others in the world. The gospel calls us to follow the path that Jesus walked, the path that led to his rejection, the path that eventually led to his death. Friends, this road is not a road for those of us who value comfort. It is not for us who want to keep things just the way that they are. If we want to follow the ethics of Christ, then we have to carry our crosses, even when that brings us suffering. And I want to be clear about something here. This suffering is not a suffering forced upon us. This suffering that I am speaking of, and I believe that Jesus is referring to in this passage, is suffering, in, this suffering is, is in many ways voluntary. The disciples in this passage have a decision to make. Do they continue to follow Jesus knowing what is coming for them? Or do they give up on this movement and go back to what they were doing before? Y'all, we get a choice. We can gather here in this place every Sunday um, and Every Wednesday, we can sing our beautiful hymns with our beautiful voices. Y'all do have some beautiful voices, my goodness. And I can get up here and I could do my sermons and give these passionate sermons or whatever. And we can do all of those things and risk very little. But if we really want to follow Christ, if we really want to love God and God's creation, if we really want to stand with the oppressed, then we must be willing to take some risks. We must be willing to challenge the oppressive and evil forces in the world, even when it costs us. And it, it can cost us. It could cost us our jobs. It could cost us financially. It could cost us our physical, mental, emotional health. It could cost us our friendships, our relationships to family. Following Christ can lead us to voluntarily suffering alongside those who involuntarily are suffering. And that's the privilege. Some of us have the choice of walking away or ignoring the pain in our world, while some of us do not have that same luxury. So yes, the gospel is going to cost us. Yes, it is going to be a hard road. But there is also good news. 
In seminary, I was taught to always end a sermon with good news. Because there is good news. Jesus said something important in this passage, and I do not want us to miss it, just like Peter missed it in the passage. Jesus said in the first verse that he would rise again. And that is the good news. Now hear me out, hear me out. I know it's not Easter yet. I'm not allowed to talk about resurrection yet. I get it, I get it. But we'll go deeper in talking about the importance of what this means uh, around resurrection. But this is the hope of this passage. These, that small phrase by Jesus, that death does not have the last word. The hardships of this world will not haunt us forever. That the work that we do for peace and justice in the world is not in vain. That is our commitment to this Christ. Our commitment to this way of living will lead to something good. Not only for us as individuals, but for the whole world as a whole. I mentioned civil rights activists or the Children's Crusade earlier, and I think about this, this whole month, I've been thinking about the civil rights activists who did not get to see the world today, who do not know that how they have contributed has affected us today. I think of those who are out protesting today. I think of Mennonite Action. I think of the work that MCC does. I think about um, the people who are working for LGBTQ folks in schools. And I think about all of you who are in justice initiatives. And friends, we do this work not so that we can you know, in two weeks, change the whole world, or a year, change the whole world, and maybe it's possible that we don't even get to see the change. But friends, this work is not in vain. This work does not go unnoticed. So y'all, we have a choice to make. How committed are we? How much are we willing to risk? We have all been invited to carry our crosses. Are we ready to pay the cost? Peace. Let's respond together by singing number 588. 588, we walk by faith in voices together. And I invite you to stand if you're able. We'll be singing all five verses.
for ascending him together, please stand and turn to 290, blessed are you. Receive this benediction. Just as Abraham did not waver through his unbelief, but was strengthened in his faith by God's promise, may we too give glory to God and be fully persuaded that God has power to do what God has promised. Go in peace.